The Black Cat, Volume 1, Number 7, April 1896. The Williamson Safe Mystery, by F. S. Hesseltine. One morning, in the spring of 1894, the attention of persons walking along Sedbury Street, Boston, was attracted to a huge iron safe that was being put out from the ware rooms of a well-known safe company, which for many years had done business on that street. The way was blocked, and all passages by cars and teams prevented, while a number of men, with great effort, by the aid of blocks, rollers, and windlass, drew the huge mass of iron onto the platform of a stout dray by which it was to be transported to its destination. Of course, passers-by wondered and queried as to the purpose and possible use of a safe of such unusual form and dimension, but the curiosity of the questioners remained unsatisfied. No one standing by knew, and the merchant with his employees was too busy to answer those who ventured to interrupt with their inquiries. This much, however, was evident. The safe was not new. Indeed, the style and appearance of it indicated that it had been built many years ago for some special purpose, in which it had doubtless seen long service. Although the appearance of this strange object so excited my curiosity that, although I was in a hurry to reach my office, I waited until the thing was finally loaded and moved slowly off up the street. Then I entered the store of the safe company and, being well acquainted with the manager, I asked if he could give me the old safe's history. He replied that there was a strange story connected with it, known now only to himself. For certain reasons it had never been known except to two people, and they had been sacredly bound, one by personal interest and the other by a solemn vow never to divulge the secret. This promise, he said, has been faithfully and sacredly kept, but now all those in any way connected with or affected by it have passed beyond the dark river. The safe, which had stood here for many years like a specter, reminding me of the dead past, has now, to my great relief, vanished forever, and I know no good reason why the strange story should not be told. While I may withhold or change names in the recital, that which I am about to relate is true and is capable to some extent of verification. More than fifty years ago, a stranger of good appearance, whose speech and manner indicated that he was of English birth, entered the shop of one Kershaw, a manufacturer on the corner of Chardon and Green Streets in this city, inquired for the proprietor, and stated that he wanted constructed a strong, fireproof safe giving the description and dimensions desired. By his conversation he appeared familiar with such work, and stated plainly how he wanted this constructed and the kind of lock required, the keyless combination not having then been invented. In answer to inquiries, he said that he was about to open a jewelry store in Hanover Street, that he did not intend to do a retail business, but would carry a considerable stock for wholesale, visiting for trade dealers in neighboring cities. He added also that as he would be absent from his store from time to time, he desired a safe of large dimensions where his stock could be safely stored during his absence as well as at night. He required no shelving in the safe and wanted it of unusual depth that he might put directly into it the cases and trunks in which he would keep or carry his stock. Being convinced of the stranger's responsibility by a large advance deposit and by the promise of full payment on completion and delivery, Mr. Kershaw accepted his order, and in due time the safe was completed and delivered. Soon after, a sign was put up on the store, J. Williamson, Wholesale Dealer in Watches and Jewelry. No great display was made in the window. Goods were received and shipped by the rear entrance, opening on an alleyway. Apparently, but little business was done at the store, and frequently Mr. Williamson was absent visiting his customers or buying additional stock in New York City. He contracted no indebtedness, paying cash for everything. He expressed a lack of confidence in banks and bankers, saying that he had once lost a large sum by the failure of a bank in which he deposited, and for the future should be his own banker. Shortly after he began business, he took up his residence on Chief Street 
in the north end of the city and attended regularly the Baldwin Place Baptist Church. No subscription paper or contribution box ever passed him without a fairly liberal donation. In disposition, he was quiet and retiring, and rarely spoke except in response to some inquiry. His earlier life he never referred to except in reply to one or two persons who ventured the question when he briefly stated that he was the second son of a well-to-do English squire, that at an early age he found that there was no future for him in the old country, and that when little more than a boy he came to New York, where he acquired a knowledge of business, and by diligence and economy saved enough to start in business. Within a year after his arrival in Boston, Mr. Williamson sought the hand of the eldest daughter of a respectable merchant, a deacon in the church which he attended, producing at the same time letters from New York endorsing his worth and character. Having thus satisfied her parents, he was accepted and with little delay married. Very soon after he was received, on profession of his faith, into the church, and by his quiet, correct life, liberality and honest dealing, secured the confidence and respect of all who knew him. About this time, a strange epidemic of crime swept over the puritanic city of Boston. The houses of the wealthy were entered and robbed of their valuable contents. Packages of money were boldly seized within the very enclosures of the bank, the thief escaping through some passageway or by fastening behind him the door through which he escaped. The satchels of bank messengers, filled with valuable contents, were suddenly snatched and the robber eluded pursuit. At night, persons were garroted and robbed on the public street. The police force was small, and although they exercised unusual diligence, every few days some new and startling crime, committed with wonderful skill and boldness, was announced. It was thought that a gang of experienced criminals had made a descent upon the city so long exempt from crime, and every stranger was under suspicion and carefully watched. One night, not long after his marriage, Mr. Williamson was found on Charlestown Bridge in a dazed, exhausted condition and assisted to his home. When sufficiently recovered, he stated that while crossing the bridge, he was suddenly seized from behind, his throat grasped so that he could not cry out, and his pocketbook, containing a large sum of money taken from him, he struggled to free himself from his unknown assailant until he gasped for breath and fell exhausted, unconscious. On the following day, Mr. Williamson offered a liberal reward for the arrest of the highwayman, but as he had not seen him, he could give no clue to aid in the detection of the criminal. Some of the persons robbed, however, who had caught a glimpse of the thief, described a dark person with heavy black hair wearing blue glass spectacles, and as it was believed that he and the assailant of Williamson were one, search was made for a person answering this description. One evening the whole city was startled by the news of a crime just committed bolder than any that had preceded it. The store of Davis and Palmer, jewelers on Washington Street, had been entered between the hours of 7 and 8 p.m., and the most valuable part of their stock taken the trays containing many valuable watches, diamonds, and jewelry, having all been emptied. As was customary, the store was closed at seven o'clock, and a night watchman came on duty within an hour after. On this evening, when the watchman entered, he found the cases stripped of their valuable contents and immediately gave the alarm. The police were sent for, and an investigation began. It was soon discovered that persons near the store had seen a sleigh drive up, a man alight, unlock, and enter the store. Not long after, he came out bringing two heavily laden bags, one after the other, which he placed in the sleigh and drove away. At the time, no suspicion had been excited, as there was nothing peculiar about his manner of entering or leaving the store. From his course of action, the thief was evidently well acquainted with the fact that there was a brief period between the closing of the store and the arrival of the watchman. 
and having at some time, doubtless, obtained an impress of the key and made a duplicate, the task of entering and robbing the store at a time when it was least expected was an easy one. In those days, there was no detective force or special police to investigate crime and capture the criminals. The attention of the few policemen employed by the city was given wholly to the preservation of order and to preventing a breach of the peace. There was, however, a force of a few constables who served civil processes and worked as private detectives for a reward, headed by an old, experienced officer, Captain Darius Clapp, and when it was known that a large reward had been offered for the discovery and return of the goods, irrespective of the arrest and conviction of the criminal, Clapp devoted himself at once to that object. As a first step, he visited every stage office, stable, vessel, and mode of egress from the city, but to no purpose. The owner of the sleigh was found, but could give no information except that it had been hired in the afternoon by a dark-haired man wearing colored glasses, and that late in the evening the team was found without any driver in Haymarket Square. As weeks passed and the mystery seemed no nearer a solution, the strange robbery became the universal topic of conversation. Every clue and suspicion was followed up. Strangers were arrested and obliged to prove their innocence. Everybody became a detective. Some weeks after the robbery, a stranger came to the express office with a trunk, which he wished transported to New York. Something in the manner of the man, an unnatural, half-disguised appearance, excited the suspicion of the alert, sharp-eyed express agent, who had been cautioned by Captain Clapp, and while he proceeded to make out the receipt, he secretly sent a messenger to the constable. Upon his arrival, that official instantly began to question the stranger, demanding to know the contents of the trunk. His inquiries were frankly answered with proper explanation, and the key produced that the captain might verify the same by examination. The innocent frankness of the stranger disarmed the constable, and, half apologizing for not accepting his statements as sufficient, the captain stooped to unlock the trunk, when suddenly the stranger leaped by him and out through the door, barring it after him by thrusting a stout cane through the iron handle. Throwing himself against the door, the captain soon broke the improvised bolt and rushed off in pursuit following the fugitive down through Dog Square, Marshall, and Hanover Streets into a narrow court leading from the last street where the man had disappeared. But though there was no outlet other than that by which he had entered, a thorough search of this place a few moments after failed to discover the fugitive or the way of his escape. After the houses opening on the court were searched without discovering any trace of the probable thief, the proprietors of the stores fronting Hanover Street on each side and having rear entrances were sent for. Among these was Mr. Williamson, but as it was ascertained at his residence that he was absent from the city, entrance was gained to his store by a side window. Here, however, as in the other stores, no person or sign of one was found. The burglar, for such an examination of the trunk at the express office proved him to be, was never captured, nor was trace of him discovered, although diligent search of that neighborhood was made by the whole police force. Not long after, the city was again startled, this time by the announcement in the morning papers of the mysterious disappearance and probable murder of Mr. Williamson. He was known to carry large sums of money upon his person, and as there was no good explanation of his absence, it was thought most probable that he had been robbed and murdered. In fact, there were some who reported hearing at night cries for help in the vicinity of his store, and a hat which had been found one morning on the street near his store proved to be one worn by him on the morning when he last left his home. Information was sought by advertisement in the newspapers with promise of liberal reward, but all investigation proved unavailing. After some weeks of vain inquiry and search, the general suspicion 
that he had been murdered and his body thrown over the Charlestown Bridge became a settled conviction, but his faithful, trusting wife refused to believe him dead, and her father finally proceeded to New York to see what information, if any, could be gained from those with whom his son-in-law had had dealings in that city. What he ascertained there I do not know, but immediately on his return he came to my employer for a workman to go to the store and open in his presence the safe containing the stock stored therein. After some drilling the bolt was sprung and the door swung open, disclosing a sight at which I started back affrighted and amazed, and which so horrified the troubled and anxious father that he fell like a dead man on the floor. There, within the safe, lay the dead body of Mr. Williamson, the trusted and respected jewelry merchant. On recovering consciousness, the good deacon, heartbroken, implored me for his sake and the fair name of his daughter never to make known the sight then revealed, and to assist him in concealing all evidence which would tend to disclose it. To both these requests I at once consented, and that night I helped him to carry out the body privately for burial, no matter where. An examination of the safe disclosed a hardly discernible aperture, drilled through the back near the top, from which, on the inside, hung a flexible tube by which respiration was made possible for a person enclosed, and through which noise from without could reach the inmate. On the inside of the door a hole had been cut, so that the key could be inserted and the bolt thrown. The handle of this key had broken off, leaving the key in the lock. There were indications that food and water had been stored in the safe, but none remained. Even the shoes bore marks of the teeth, as if gnawed for sustenance. A black wig and blue glass spectacles lay on the floor of the safe. Seeing all this, we soon conjectured for what purpose the safe was made and used, a temporary place of quick retreat. We wondered if the key was broken by accident in the haste to elude that last pursuit or in attempting to reopen the door. We thought we knew now, though each was silent, the mystery of the many recent crimes, but one thing was certain. They ceased, and the author of them was never found or arrested.' 